Now I'll read today's Bible passage. Today's passage is Revelation chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Revelation chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice, he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling for demons and a haunt for every impure spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable animal. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Pour her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torment and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart, she boasts, I sit enthroned as queen. I am not a widow. I will never mourn. Therefore, in one day her plagues will overtake her death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. Please allow me to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be able to worship you together today. Sometimes, Lord, the grace and the blessings you bestow upon us are things that we think about and start counting in some cases, and we forget more about you and focus on those things. Lord, allow us to focus rather on your grace. And Lord, please strengthen our faith. And this week, Lord, we ask that through the message we're about to hear, you be able to encourage us. And through your grace, Lord, allow us to walk forward. Please watch over Pastor Anjiki as he speaks this morning. We have great expectations. Pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, everyone. How are you all doing? Today, it's likely that you uh, had a peaceful morning. <laughs> However, when you look around the world, though, there are a lot of countries that are facing war or facing famine and all kinds of other things. Especially on February of this year, since Russia has gone into the Ukraine, there's been a lot of different changes that have occurred around the world. One of those changes is the imbalance of the food chain or food system. Up until that point, or up until then anyway, around the world, those who were facing hunger were, you know, in existence, of course. However, since the food supply has all of a sudden not been able to get be given to them, it's created more problems. In a period of a year, the amount of food the Earth can produce is, if it is given out effectively to everyone, there's not going to be anyone who is hungry around the world. That's just how much food can be produced. So we actually have enough food to feed everyone. 
the world is capable of producing that much that much food. However, this year, the balance of uh, allocating this food supply has changed, and those who are facing famine or were facing famine are seriously facing it now. And part of this is due to the situation in the Ukraine and the impact of food not being able to be exported or imported to certain countries. In the upcoming history, it's possibly going to look back on 2020 and refer to that as the time when the balance of things started to become offset. If you look at China, for example, just recently, there was a special uh, meeting that just finished. Uh, Xi Jinping said that, uh, he actually proclaimed that he will extend his uh, rule and to actually go and hasn't mentioned anything clearly about Taiwan and, and, and also going into invading there. In the UK, there was a new um, prime minister by the name of Taurus and she even made a strong proclamation of what she had, was planning to do, but in just in a month and a half, period of month and a half, she is uh, resigning or is coming to have to quit. And so now the UK is maybe going to be facing a very difficult time. Also, next month in America, there is going to be a mid-term uh, election, and uh, it's, we've heard that President, former President, President Trump is possibly considered running again. And it's said that President, former President Trump has been uh, regarded as a, the tr president who divided America. Those who really love him, love him. But those who don't love him, really don't. <laughs> they hate hearing his name and seeing his face. It's just a really d divided uh, opinions about the former president. And so this is how he has been uh, regarded as a president who divided the country. However, in the past, in America, there has been a president that has even more divided the country than President, former President Trump, and that is President Lincoln. He was uh, opposed to the slave system and proclaimed that strongly in 1860. He was the 16th president of the United States by the name of Abraham Lincoln. However, the seven states in the South were were determined to continue the slavery system. And the following year from uh, res presidency uh, is when the Confederate States of America were formed by these uh, states and a war began, the Civil War. There were four states in the middle who determined, decided to go with the South, and in the end, there was a, a total of 11 Southern states that were in opposition to the American government starting the Civil War. So American Americans were fighting and killing other Americans over this. In the World War I, however, the number of American soldiers killed in battle was 290,000. In the Korean War, it was 140,000. However, in the Civil War, the number of uh, people killed in battle was 500,000. So, of course, there'd be more number of people because it's the same country. However, you can see that the, the most divided America really possibly was, was actually at that time. And he was, President Lincoln was actually assassinated in, over this. If you ask Americans, though, eh, what's their opinion of President, former President Lincoln, there's not anyone who really says anything bad about him because it's actually, he's regarded as one of the best presidents in the history. So there's actually a lot of uh, instances about of President Lincoln that are um, recorded. There was once a time when a, a reporter was asking him a question and, and said, you know, there's a lot of people that are, you know, don't think well of you, and there's a lot of things that are being said bad about you. How is it that you're able to put up with all of this? It seems that you would be very, have a difficulty with uh, psychologically with these issues. So how is it that you have this strong mental state? And when Lincoln was asked this, he replied by saying the following. We can complain because rose bushes have thorns. 
or rejoice because thorn bushes have roses. So when you think about this, you can realize that this world is a world that is created by Creator God. And because we are away from our Creator, it's not this beautiful, perfect world anymore. And now it's a world that's full of thorns and difficulties. Lincoln, of course, was an amazing、uh, Christian, and he had a very good understanding of the world and worldview. He understood that the world was fallen, and because of this, that the world was facing many difficult things. That's why it wasn't just beautiful roses everywhere, but rather thorns. And, of course, you know, there were instances of nice things that happened as well. However, because of the fall due to sin, thinking that this world is going to be perfect is a big mistake. This world is filled with sin. And because of that, there are terrible things and tragedies that happen. And that's why you don't have to be too upset over them because it's a natural thing. And once again, as I said before, we can complain because rose bushes have thorns or rejoice because thorn bushes have roses. So there's two different ways you can be looking at the same thing. You can focus on the beautiful aspects or those that are painful. So I really appreciate、um, Lincoln's worldview and perspective and how he was able to realize that this world truly is fallen due to human sin. And so, of course, it is obvious there's going to be terrible things that happen. And to not have super high expectations of the world because then you will likely be greatly disappointed in return. That said, there are times when there are beautiful things that happen, and those things are to be evaluated and enjoyed as such. As for humanity, it is. It is unrealistic for us to re- realize or expect paradise on this world, but we can expect that in the future because we know that the Bible promises that after Jesus Christ returns to this world, that is referred to Jesus' second coming. At that time, Jesus Christ will come to this world as king and he will rule and reign over everything. That's a period of a thousand years. The thousand year reign is referred to, or the Messiah,、uh, Messiah, Messiah reign. This period of a thousand years is a time when there is going to be complete stop to the rule, of,、uh, the rule and reign of the devil, and it will truly be a nice time. Today, we're looking at just exactly what's going to happen prior to that time. We're going through the book of Revelation, as you realize, and we're looking at the history of humanity and how, what's going to happen in the very last stages of that, at the time specifically of God's judgment on earth. This period of seven years is re- separated into the three and a half, first three and a half years and the second three and a half years. The book of Revelation explains what is going to happen in this time period. Pretty much in a chronological fashion. However, there are a few times when there are inserted portions into this book which are not chronological. As we've already learned in chapters 15 through 16, we've looked, exact, looked at what is going to happen in the second、uh, three and a half years of the Great Tribulation. And we read about the part about Armageddon. However, we know that by Jesus Christ's return, that this will all come to an end. What's going to happen next? Is well, of course, on Jesus Christ's return, and that's mentioned in chapter 19. So, actually, chapter 17 and 18 are inserted chapters or sections in Revelation. Chapter 17 focuses on the first three and a half year period of the Great Tribulation and gives a more detailed ep-、uh, explanation of it. Chapter 18 focuses on the second three and a half years of the Great Tribulation and also explains、uh, everything in more detail. So that's the structure of Revelation. It's important to understand the structure as you're reading through it to have a better understanding of the content. In chapter 17 and 18, it refers to Babylon the Great.、And、this Babylon that it's referring to is something that you really have to understand. So, of course, it does refer to Babylon as a specific place or port town. And there is this town of Babylon still in existence today. It's located in Iraq. In Iraq, the, te- the,、um, the capital is Baghdad, and it's a very prosperous place where there's a lot of people living there. 
and from Baghdad, about 90 kilometers south is Babylon, and that's where the town is located. It's by near along the Euphrates uh, River, and it was once a very prosperous town. In the old uh, Babylonian Empire, it was actually the capital there, and that's where the Tower of Babel was. And uh, Nero, the dictator, was ruling and reigning at that time. When the new Babylon uh, came to uh, existence, which of course is still many, many years ago, um, it was also very uh, prosperous. And the, the capital also was in Babylon. Right now, it's actually considered to be a UNESCO World Heritage Site, uh, notified, uh, rising, uh, recognized as that in 2019. So it's a very old historic uh, city. However, Babylon does have a long history, and it does have a great history of being prosperous. The Babylonian Empire is what was taken out eventually by Persian, the Persian Empire and by the uh, Greek as well. So for a long period of time, Babylon has not, has been regarded as the center of the world. Oh, and according to Bible prophecy, at the end of the t world, Babylon will once again be regarded as the center of the world. In present days, if you look at Babylon, you would just, um, it'd be very difficult to imagine that that could be a possibility. However, the Bible explains that that is exactly what's going to happen. The prophecies of the Bible are all true. There's not a single one that has not come to pass. It also, in, for example, it explained that the country of the Jews would be reestablished, and that did come to place in 1948 when the country of Israel being reinstated. However, up to that time, there was a lot of people who would doubt that could even be a possibility, F especially when uh, Hitler assassinated so many Jews, it was impossible to think that there would ever be the possibility of Israel coming to exist again when their pe the people of Israel had almost all been killed off. However, after the world, the world war ended, in just a period of three years, Israel was reestablished. And in this way, it is true that Babylon, too, will once again become the center of the world at the end of humanity. The first three and a half years of the Great Tribulation are what we covered in our previous uh, session. And it, expl it explains how the outward ruler of the world at that time is actually this unified uh, religious system or organization. And this organization rules the entire world. Of course, behind it is the Antichrist, but he's hidden in the, during the first three and a half year period. After the first three and a half years in, though, all of a sudden, the Antichrist comes forward and expresses his true character, takes out this organized, uh, organized religion system and proclaims himself as God. And in the temple in uh, Jerusalem, he has idol uh, statue of himself made, and he demands that people worship him. In other words, the first three and a half years of the Great Tribulation are is is uh, that is ruled by the religious organization is and it's actually taken out, and that's what we've already looked at. Uh, Revelation 16, 17, 16. The beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her in flesh and burn her with fire. So this is referring here to the prostitute, which is the uh, religious organization. The Bible clearly states that uh, idols are sometimes referred to as this um, prostitute. And this uh, Unified religious organization here is what it's being referred to as the prostitute. Once again, they will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her in flesh and burn her with fire. So this clearly states how the Antichrist takes out this unified or religious organization, proclaiming himself as the king or the god. And in chapter 18, you can see how Babylon comes to the scene and it becomes the center of the religious, political, and economic range. Babylon the Great 
is what we're looking at today in light of this. We're looking specifically at verses 1 through 8, and there's three main points. The first one is the declaration of the fall of Babylon. Verse 1, after this, and after this is referring to what happened in chapter 17, it's indicating that this is continuation of chapter 17. I saw another angel, and here we already learned that there was one angel in chapter 17, so this is indicating that there's another one. Coming down from heaven, he had great authority. So this indicates this other angel has great authority, and he would therefore he would have had to been a high position angel. There are other angels, of course, but in the angels' uh, hierarchy, there are some who have higher authority than others. And so he, this one it's referring to here was one obviously had a higher authority. There are some angels that are arch archangels, for example, Gabriel and Michael, who are referred to specifically by name in the Bible. These are angels um, that had this specific authority. And here we can see how it's coming down from heaven and how the great, the earth was illuminated by his splendor. This splendor is God's splendor or God's uh, glory. And it was not the glory or splendor of the angel himself. It was just expressed through this angel. In the Old Testament times, we, you may remember how Moses went up Mount Sinai and he talked with God. He received the Ten Commandments on rocks, stone, tablets, and brought them down to the people. And you may remember that his face was shining with the glory of God. This wasn't in God, Moses' glory in of itself, but rather a reflection of that of God. This uh, angel mentioned here is the same kind of situation. He was full of glory and splendor as he came down from heaven since he had been around God. As we've already learned, the world has already lost its light, in a sense, in three stages. So at this time, it's not as light and bright as it is today, for example. It probably is kind of slightly dark out. And maybe just like there's a spotlight coming down on the angel with such light applied to him. It's like the people would have paid great attention to him. And he, with a mighty voice, shouts in verse 2, fallen. And so shouted means and proclaimed here, sorry. And what he proclaimed is that fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. Here it's Fallen, the word fallen is in there twice, and this indicates that it's very important as it is reiterated. When we, are, are, when we have something that's very important to say, we often say it two times, like, go, go, or do your best, do your best, or way to go, way to go. Say things two times. In the same way, Babylon is taken down, tw and, that's, and that is clearly stated here as fallen is indicated twice. In Babylon, what happens to it afterward is mentioned next. It says that she has become a dwelling for demons and a haunt for every impure spirit, a haunt for every clean bird, and a haunt for every unclean and detestable animal. So Babylon, that was great. One time, it, you, you can see it was quite prosperous. However, it was taken out or destroyed. And you can see that it actually becomes a dwelling for demons. When Jesus returns to the earth and has the reign, the thousand year reign, that is a time period when the devil and demons are all gone and they can't work or do any, have any influence on the world. The reason why I can say this is that the demon himself has already been tossed into the abyss, thrown into the abyss. And in Greek, it's it's called abyss. And for the period of the thousand year reign, that's where the demon, uh, the devil is. And so he can't escape. His demons, however, they are put into the town of Babylon. And that is uh, where they are kept. So for this period of a thousand years, there is no a form of devil or demon, demonic work around the world. And so there's no tem uh, temptation in that sense. And there's no people running toward evil because there's they're all 
all that evilness has been taken out. So Babylon becomes this dwelling for demons then. Why is it that Babylon is uh, is judged? Well, in verse 3 it says, For all the drinks she nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. And this of uh, her it's referring to is um, Babylon. And her is often refers to a, a town or a city as a, impersonates her. Once again, the nations have all drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the per merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. So here, you can hear, th you can learn about three different types of people. Uh, the polit politicians are the kings of the earth. The merchants are the, the very uh, rich people, people who have great authority as well, and people who have a lot of uh, wealth. And all the people who follow these people, these are people who have the number 666. The numbers, if you do not have the number 666, you won't be able to do any, make any financial transactions at this time. So the common point of these three p groups of people is that these are people who all given their hearts to the Antichrist and follow him. And Babylon is taken out, and so along with that, they too are judged. In the Old Testament, you may remember the story of Sodom and Gom Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah were uh, uh, towns that were just filled with immorality, and God took a judgment out upon them through Abraham. He, God said, I can't stand to look at this anymore. I want to take this, these cities out. And so he sent fire and, uh, and destroyed it. However, regarding Lot, Abraham's uh, a relative, he told him he to escape and to not look back and just get out of there as fast as possible. That's how Lot's family was able to escape. However, his wife uh, alone looked back and became a pillar of salt, it said. So he, there was another voice telling people to get out. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, and this is in response to this the declaration of proclamation of Babylon falling. After going into the Great Tribulation, there are people who become saved and become Christians. And these people are saved through the work of the 144,000 uh, missionaries, in a sense, who are working around the world to reach people still with the truth of the gospel. Prior to the Great Tribulation starting, we will all be taken up to heaven in, a, in the rapture. So any present Christian will not have to go through the Great Tribulation. Those people who have already placed their faith in Christ and have passed away will be taken up to heaven. And then the next group of people going up to heaven will be uh, those of us still alive at the time of the rapture. So there's not going to be a single true Christian left behind when the Great Tribulation starts. However, through the work of the 144,000 uh, missionary workers, there will be a lot of people who actually do become Christians at this time. And in the town of Babylon as well, we can see how there were Christians there by this passage we can realize that even in Babylon, which was filled with idol worship and people worshiping the Antichrist, that there were actually Christians there as well. There is a, a, a gospel uh, a association by the name of the, the Slavic Gospel Association working to reach that specific group of people, Russian and Ukrainian and Bereshian. Of course, they're uh, fighting each other at this moment, but this group is working to reach peop those people for the, the, the Christ, the gospel of Christ. And in that area, there are about um, 2,200 uh, true Bible teaching churches in existence. And these are churches that do truly teach the Bible and teach that through faith in Christ and Christ alone, you can be saved. So those are the 
the churches that exist now in that area, about 2,200 of them. And now it's, it's amazing to know that there's a lot of people being saved in this, those churches now. And in a time of uh, war and tribulation for those people at this present time, you can see how that's really gospel truth is really hitting their hearts. So Babylon the Great, which is filled with idol worship, and also the place, the location of the Antichrist, is still a, a location where people can be saved. People realize that Antichrist is not the true God and that they do need to realize who the true God is. However, that comes to an end. And so this other voice from heaven is telling the, the, the Christians left behind to get out. At that time, the spiritual status of the Babylon is also mentioned. Specifically, let's look at verse 7. Give her as much torment and grief as the glory of luxury she gave herself. In her heart, she boasts, I have sit enthroned as queen. I am not a window. I will never mourn. And this phrase actually was said by a different person or country, I should say. And that is the new Babylonian Empire at the time of King Nebuchadnezzar and the prophet Isaiah. If you look at Isaiah 47, uh, 7, it says, you said, oh, and this is referring to uh, Isaiah prophesying to Nebuchadnezzar. He said, you said, I will continue forever the eternal queen, but you did not consider these things or reflect on what might happen. Now then, listen, you wanton creature lounging in your security and saying to yourself, I am, and there is none besides me. I will never be a widow or suffer the loss of children. Both of these will overtake you in a moment on a single day, loss of children and widowhood. They will come upon you in full measure in spite of your many sorceries and all your potent spells. That's what it said. So this is the time of Nebuchadnezzar and the, the prosperity in Babylon at that time. Nebuchadnezzar was saying, there's no one who's bigger than, greater than me. And uh, the prophet Isaiah came to tell him otherwise. He actually said, you're going to fall in just an instant. You're going to be taken out. In just a day, you're going to be taken out. And because of your pride, you're going to be, uh, you're going to be judged by God. And a hundred years after Isaiah prophesied that, it did come to pass. And so Isaiah was not able to actually see this come to pass with his own eyes. However, it was true. What he prophesied was true, and it did come to pass. And what was taken out was uh, it was taken over by King, uh, King Cyrus of the Persian Empire. The Bible's prophecies have all come to pass and none of them have gone astray. Babylon has become prideful, you can see, and sh shown how it thought it was special. However, that's not the case. In, in Isaiah, God says numerous times, I am God and God alone. There is no other. God himself is the special one. And that is correct. It, it, God, creator God, should be the one who would say such a thing. And that he would say such a thing to the, his created beings. He would say, of course he would say, I am the one and only. However, the same exact phrase was used by King Neb Neb Nebuchadnezzar, a created being by God. He proclaimed himself as special and unique and being no other. And because of his pride, God t told him that his country would be judged. And a hundred years later, that did come to pass. The Babylonian Empire did fall. And it was just in a period of a day. On October 5th and 6th, 539 BC is when it came in because the Persian Empire came in on the 5th in the evening, and by the 6th, it was taken out. So it truly was in a period of a day. One thing really interesting about this is that the 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 of course the um, 
capital of that area was Babylon. And the, even if it was taken out, the capital was still put there. And when the Greek Empire took charge or took reign and was ruling that area, they actually did place the capital in, Bab uh, capital in Babylon as well. So that has truly been a central place in human history multiple times. And at the end days, it is said that that is going to happen once more. Now back to uh, Revelation 18, verse 8. Here it's talking about the great bubble and the great and how it's going to be taken out in one day. And that will be in just an instant. In the actual um, translation, actual words of the book, it is actually emphasizing that, emphasizing that this will take, take place in a period of just a day, very quick, in just an instant, in other words. The result of judgment is listed in, chap in verse 8. Therefore, in one day her plagues will overtake her death, mourning and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord great God who judges her. The town of Babylon is destroyed. All the politicians and all the millionaires and those people following uh, the Antichrist are also destroyed. However, the Antichrist is not there at that time. Where is he? He's actually in Armageddon. He was there, and he's getting his armies together to fight Jerusalem and to take out that area. So he's not actually in Babylon at that time. He's in Armageddon for the battle there. However, right after that, the army, too, is taken out by uh, Jesus Christ as he returns. Why is it that the Bible explains the end times and does it in multiple times, even though it hasn't even happened yet? Well, it's because it's a warning to us just letting us know ahead of time that this is what's going to happen. And not just that it's going to happen, but also to tell us that there is a way of salvation to avoid this, and that's the death and, uh, and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the cross. So God has told us that there is a way that we can avoid this tragedy. It's kind of like a safety net that has been provided to us and for us prior to the destruction that will take place. And God gives this opportunity to all people to receive the salvation and uh, assurance of this. At the time of the Great East Japan earthquake and thereafter, there has been a lot of natural disasters that have happened. And in light of this, there's been a lot of warnings and specific terminology used for such uh, uh, warnings. And uh, one of those phrases is like, uh, take care, you know, make sure you take care of your life. For example, when there was a huge uh, typhoon headed for Japan and it might, and there was a time recently when it might have came to Japan, um, but it wasn't, we weren't sure, but they were telling people ahead of time, warning them numerous times to take care, take measures for your own life. However, the Bible has already been warning us for over 2,000 years now. There's been a lot of warnings that the Bible still tells us to protect not our present life, but our eternal life. When we hear this, we need to focus on preparing for eternity. Those of us who already made the decision to accept Christ as Savior are safe, but it's likely that there are people around you who haven't even heard of this. They don't even know about salvation or the love of God. Or there are some people who have heard it, but they haven't uh, received this as the truth. When you think about that, it, it really does hurt our hearts. We do desire that as many people as possible be able to hear this warning and truly accept it, truly accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. And we pray also that we can be used to reach such people. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you so much for allowing us to hear your words about your love and your warnings as well. 
We know, Lord, that already there are many people here who have already been saved and that regardless of when the Great Tribulation starts, many of us will be okay. However, it's true that many of our family members and friends are not saved yet. We ask, Lord, that you can use us who are very weak and small, but use us to be able to reach such people who have yet to hear or believe in your truth. Allow us to be able to share your love with them. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now we'll have a moment to pray in silence.